Welcome. This podcast um, will look at um, the question, how democratic was the Weimar Republic of 1919 to January 1933? It's based on the excellent essay by Stephen J. Lee from his book, The Weimar Republic, um, which is in chapter three. Um, Quick overview before we go into the details. It consists of basically four major areas. Um, It begins with an introduction. Secondly, it moves into um, the strengths of the Weimar Weimar Constitution or the Weimar Republic um, in theory. Thirdly, it looks at the um, underlying weaknesses of the Weimar Republic um, which and it identifies four major weaknesses, and then it finishes with a conclusion. So we'll just go straight into the first part, which is the introduction. So zooming into the sort of key points um, here. So Lee begins by pointing out um, that there is a major contradiction um, between the theory and the practice. Theoretically, when the Weimar Republic was created in 1919, um, Germany became the most advanced democracy in Europe. So that's the theory, but the the clash was with the reality. And the flaw was that the <coughs> although the individual components that made up the constitution were strong, it was the relationship between them, the way in which they actually worked together um, that was fundamentally flawed. Um, and that weakness was extenuated by external pressures on this fragile constitution. And in particular, in particular the, cons- the um, external pressures from the conservative right wing that exploited those weaknesses to their advantage um, and as a result captured (coughs) what was theoretically a parliamentary regime that gave power to the people and converted it into an authoritarian regime. In other words, Hitler's dictatorship that um, Hitler very quickly um, created in 1933. I mean, that capturing and dismantling of the Weimar Republic was astonishingly quick. Uh, what is known as the legal revolution um, that uh, was from February 1933 until about the summer of 1933. Hitler dismantled the Weimar Constitution in about four or five months. That, though, is a separate um, question and a separate um, essay. So, Let's move into the um, first component of Lee's essay, (coughs) which was the theory. So, in theory, the Weimar Constitution was the most advanced democracy in Europe. Um, Drafted by Hugo Preuss, Jewish liberal lawyer. Um, Some nice, um, nice details in the Stephen Lee essay. It combined the best elements of the American and French constitutions um, with 20th century refinements. Uh, So it was a very modern constitution and it it deliberately set out to improve the constitution of the Second Reich that Bismarck had created in 1871. Um, Interesting, this pulling back and sort of seeing the whole of German history synoptically. Um, When we eventually reach the collapse of Nazi Germany in 1945 and the creation of the Federal Republic of Germany in 1949. Um, That constitution that was created in 1949 for the new West Germany likewise tried to retain the best elements of the Weimar constitution um, but at the same time attempted to uh, fix its weaknesses. Again, that is a later story, but um, these separate components all do build up and relate to each other. Okay, so um, let's go into the details of this. 
Um, Article 1, and it, it, it is important in the examination that you really show the precise sort of knowledge. And the very first article, in fact it is the first article, shows you how central and how important it, it is, was that, quote, and it's worthwhile, yeah, learn that quote, um, political authority emanates from the people. Okay, It was a parliamentary regime. Um, there are some details there. Um, universal, direct, equal and secret suffrage, um, voting rights um, for all men and women aged 21 and over. Um, proportional representation, I won't go into the details, um, but on th if theoretically that was a, um, that was a strength. Um, one Reichstag seat for every 60,000 votes. Um, so it was not a first-past-the-post system such as we have in Britain today. Um, the first-past-the-post system, the people will vote for a parliamentary candidate from your constituency. So each constituency returns um, a member to parliament. Um, didn't work that way. Basically, everybody voted, they chose their political party, and then um, one member was returned for every 60,000 votes, and effectively there were lists of members for each party, and they would allocate the appropriate number of seats to each party from the lists. Um, again, we're looking at strengths here, so as a result, all interests were represented. That's whether it's social class, a working middle, upper class were all equally represented. Um, uh, all the localities were equally represented, um, the different regions of Germany, and um, the sectional interests, um, so um, uh, different sectional interests. Um, so, for example, nation nationalities, national minorities, and also religious interests, Protestants and Catholics. It, it, it was a genuinely representative voting system. Um, the other, the other strength is that um, again, good use of language here. So, pick up the key words. Um, there were two types of elections. Um, the, the the every four years, the people voted for a political party. Um, and that was the Reichstag elections that they sent to the Reichstag. But every seven years, they voted for the head of state, the president. Um, um, the, that obviously was uh, replaced the um, the monarchy. Uh, that's what we call pleb plebiscitary powers. Uh, a plebiscite is where you uh, where people vote uh, not for a political party, but they make a choice. Um, it can be either a choice over an issue, a yes or no. Uh, policy, or in this case, you're choosing um, who you want your head of state to be. Remember, the president as head of state was a uh, representative um, person, uh, not supposed to be directly involved in government. Secondly, Article 54, um, the Reich Chancellor and Reich Ministers require the confidence of the Reichstag. So in other words, it is a system in which accountability was to the people. So accountability was from the Chancellor and the Reich Ministers. The Chancellor and the Reich Ministers are the cabinet, loosely what we would call the government. The government now has to give account for what they do to the Reichstag, and the Reichstag is elected by the people. So it is accountability to the people. Power lies with the people. Whereas in the Second Reich, in contrast to the Second Reich, um, Bismarck and the state secretaries, the cabinet, uh, did not have to give account to the Reichstag. And they gave account upwards to the Kaiser. Thirdly, federalism um, was a strength. Um, it retained the best elements of the Second Reich, so it provided for the rights of the individual states. There were 18 of them all together. That's a nice phrase there, as a counterbalance to central powers. So you've got the central government, that legislates, that passes laws on national issues, but the 18 separate states retained significant powers. Um, use the correct language. It was Section 1V, and it's the word autonomy. Autonomy means the right of self-rule. The separate states were the land lender. Okay, that's, so use the correct word. And they were represented centrally, in the Reichsrat, which pre replaced the old Bundesrat, but basically worked in very much the same way. So it was a counterbalance um, to central government, in theory. 
um, w which was a strength. Um, the power, the traditional power of Prussia, um, was reduced. Um, in the old Bundesrat of Bismarck's Germany, Prussia, remember, had held the majority of votes in the old Bundesrat, which gave them, uh, they had 17 seats and the power of veto. Um, the way in which the new Reichsrat worked um, reduced that influence, deliberately made sure that one state did not have that influence as it did in the old Germany before 1919. There's a nice, uh, moving to the next point, point number four, there's a nice section there, um, again, to learn the, the basic Bill of Rights so enshrined, learn those numbers, equality before the law, liberty of travel, um, inviolability of the home, freedom to express an opinion. And then the all-famous Article 48 um, was designed, in theory, to safeguard democracy by giving the president emergency powers, if necessary, to defend the parliamentary system against extremist threats from the extreme left and the extreme right. Um, and even the there were powers, if the president's actions were deemed to be arbitrary, um, to be used in the wrong way, the Reichstag did have the power to rescind, to um, cancel the president's emergency powers. But um, well, we, as we move into the second part, the problems, um, we'll see that, that that works on the assumption that the Reichstag was unified and could make that decision collectively. That, of course, did not happen because the Reichstag became very, very um, divided. So let's move into the third part of the essay. So the first part was the introduction, the second part was the strengths, the third part is the problems, um, the reality. And Lee identifies four key problems. The first problem was the difficulty that the Weimar Constitution had to create a stable government. Now, the difficulty was that there were 30 or more parties contesting each election. And there was no provision within the Constitution to eliminate the smallest parties. So because it was so fair... Um, if a party, say, had 5% of the vote, they had 5% of the seats in the Reichstag. And that meant the Reichstag was packed with lots and lots of political parties. Now, the <coughs> alternative voting system, which Weimar Germany did not have, but, for example, we have in Britain today, is what is called the first-past-the-post system, which has a built-in provision to make sure that the tiny parties don't get a representation in Parliament, which therefore ensures that there are less parties in Parliament, which therefore makes it more likely that one party can have a majority, or more likely that a combination of two or three parties will make a majority. But when you've got many, many parties, by definition, each party is going to have a smaller proportion of the total of seats, and therefore it's going to be a, more difficult for, com for, for a, one party to have a majority. B, it's going to make it more difficult for two or more parties to join to make a majority. Um, and three, it's going to make it more more, more difficult um, for parties to reach an agreement. Um, again, we have the advantage of hindsight in that. We can look at Britain today and argue that that is a strength of, of the way the British constitution works. Um, we can also look at um, what happened later, um, so after um, World War II, when they created a West German government, they did address that within the new constitution called the Basic Law that basically said if any party had less than 5% of the vote, they could not have any seats in um, the German parliament. But that was later, that was 1949. But there was no national threshold um, within the Weimar Constitution, which was a weakness. So as a result, coalition governments became a fact of life. There's a nice quote from the historian Bookbinder there. 
um, talking about the fact it was very difficult to get parties to make compromises, um, to work together. Coalitions will only work if parties are prepared to make compromises with each other, to find common ground. Also, an important point, there was no history of cooperation between the parties. What does that mean? Well, that's because parliamentary democracy was very new to Germany. Um, Germany itself was a new country. It had only existed since 1871. It's very easy to say, oh, well... Um, cooperation and um, compromise worked well in Britain. Well, Britain uh, has had democratic institutions for hundreds of years. Political parties have, have developed the ability to make compromise, but that um, was not um, that history was not there uh, in Germany. So that's a useful point to make. So um, don't talk in blanket terms. It's obviously important to recognise that there was change. Um, initially, at the beginning, there was a degree of compromise. It did work. It got off to a strong start. So you got those three parties: the SPD, the German People's Party, and the uh, sorry, the German Democratic Party and the Centre Party. They were able to come together. A coalition did form, made up of seventy-six percent of the vote. But then, the Treaty of Versailles and the economic problems that happened after the Treaty of Versailles. Um, completely changed the political climate because what happened is those three parties, their vote dropped in subsequent elections. And from that point on, those three parties that had found that common ground and could work together could no longer get a majority. Um, in the next election, their support dropped to 48%. And what that basically meant was uh, they had to bring other parties into their coalition. But also one of the problems was that um, that participation in government lost you support. Um, so increasingly, and it was particularly the case with the SPD, particularly the SPD, um, that um, the, from 1923 onwards, the SPD... Um, rather than be part of a coalition and have to make unpopular decisions which would lose them votes, the SPD chose not to become involved in government. So when they were invited to take part in coalitions or asked to take part in coalitions, they didn't. And that was pretty much the situation for the, for, um, throughout the 1920s. Um, so that we'll move on to now, I think, with the, with, with, with the next point. So just moving on to the next um, page. So there we are. OK, as a result, other parties um, needed to be brought into the coalition. So three parties could not make a majority. It had to be four or more parties um, that made um, decision making more difficult. Um, so, for example, the German People's Party, led by Stresemann, was brought into coalitions. But another problem, the largest political party, the SPD, as I say, made that deliberate decision to withdraw, um, to not be involved in coalition governments. Um, they would rather be an opposition party. Um, and that was from 1923 to 28. Um, and in 1929, when the Great Depression hit Germany, um, the uh, SPD completely withdrew um, against the proposals um, by the um, the new Chancellor Bruning um, to cut unemployment benefits. Uh, and the SPD were not prepared to associate with those very, very unpopular policies that would have lost them their votes from the working classes. Uh, so they did not take part. And therefore, if you got the largest party in the sort of centre ground of politics that are not accepting an invitation to join government, um, you had to find combinations of parties from the extreme left or the, the extreme right to take part in government. And, that, and, and getting those parties to actually work together was very, very difficult. Uh, the second problem then that um, uh, Lee talks about, um, and this is the one that uh, uh, everyone will focus on a GCSE, but it's just one of four problems. But nevertheless, it was, uh, according to Lee, the most serious issue was, of course, Article 48, which, as we said, was intended to safeguard democracy. But, nice little quote there, it was used in a profoundly undemocratic way. What does it mean by that? OK, the, the, the first thing then is... Um, 
that, as we said, the chancellors found it very, very difficult to form coalition governments they, because they could not get that support in the Reichstag to pass normal laws. So if, if you cannot form a coalition government, then they had to increasingly revert to Article 48, which was the provision to pass laws by parliament, by presidential decree. Article 48, therefore, allowed the president to suspend constitutional process and govern by decree. A capable president, Hebert, used that power only occasionally, and it was used well to protect parliamentary democracy. So examples being the cap putsch of 1920. Article 48 was used to put down the cap putsch. However, in 1925, Hebert died and a new president was elected for seven years and re-elected in 1932, President Hindenburg. He used that power not occasionally, but he used it regularly. And he used it not to safeguard parliamentary democracy, but he used it in a way that was unsympathetic to democracy. So some examples of that. He appointed a chancellor, Chancellor Bruning, and Bruning's mentality was not to go to the Reichstag to pass laws, which is what he should have done, according to the Constitution. He too readily didn't bother trying to go use the Reichstag. He too readily resorted to the easy option of taking a draft law to the president to sign it off by presidential decree. That became the norm between 1930 and 1932. So basically, democracy broke down um, with the onset of the Great Depression in 1929. Bruning was eventually, well, he eventually resigned. He was forced out and replaced by Chancellor Papen in 1932, who did the same. To the extent, Papen had no support in the Reichstag at all. He was supposed to give account to the Reichstag, um, but he had no no support. Um, there was no political party prepared to support von Papen. So Papen, just his day-to-day -day business was not to go to the Reichstag. He just readily used Article 48 to get laws passed by presidential decree. Um, and Papen didn't last very long. He lasted for six months. He was replaced by General Kurt Schleicher in late 1932, actually in December 1932, who also had no support in the Reichstag. So the point is, is that you've got those three chancellors covering that three-year period. Um, and by the end of 1932, uh, the process of passing laws through the Reichstag had almost been forgotten. Democracy broke down. So when Hitler was appointed Chancellor in 1933, in January 1933, um, he was really sort of picking up on uh, the, 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 the um, undemocratic um, process had become the norm. So um, we tend to often think of Hitler as he, that was the beginning of the collapse of democracy. Actually, democracy started to collapse before Hitler. So there's a nice little quote there. After 1931, presidential authoritarianism, that's a nice little line for you, almost completely replaced parliamentary sovereignty. Article 48 of the Constitution had swelled in importance, while Article 54, um, that we've mentioned earlier, had uh, diminished. Article 54, remember, was the uh, article that said that chancellors were supposed to give account to the Reichstag and not to the president, but Article 54 had effectively um, was not being used. There's some nice, there are some nice um, statistics there which you can use. Um, so the uh, there you can see how lawmaking by presidential decree significantly increased during this period, and correspondingly, you can see how the occasions that the Reichstag sat and was used um, declined. Um, the, num the number of days in each year that the Reichstag actually um, sat and was was used um, decreased from 94 days to 13 days by 1932. 
How far was Hindenburg responsible for this? It, um, th th this is um, a, 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 an area of um, debate. It, um, avoid falling into the trap of making snap judgments. Lee does this in a balanced way. Um, he basically makes the point um, that there is definitely agreement amongst historians that Hindenburg was responsible um, for, uh, actually the quote there, the terrorist power grab of a minority government under Hitler. Um, but what was an older view that um, Hindenburg uh, deliberately allowed that to happen is pretty much not accepted nowadays. Um, as Schultz, the historian, has pointed out, Hindenburg basically uh, was very determined to be a good president of the Republic. He was determined to make the Constitution work. He did his best, but the problem was his lack of ability. He, he was old, um, and his mental powers were declining. Um, he had little grasp of the realities of politics. He was by nature a soldier, remember? And so he was too easily tempted to seek shortcuts, which Article 48 allowed him to do. Um, he was too impatient. So it was not so much his intention. He wasn't deliberately undermining um, democracy. Um, that, that's important because Hindenburg, for example, did not like Hitler, um, and he uh, did his best to find alternatives to Hitler becoming Chancellor. Um, but um, he was old, and he, more to the point, he was, he was easily influenced. So we'll move on to that one um, in a minute, the sort of external pressures we'll come on to in a second. OK, so the third problem then um, was this issue of um, federalism. The relationship between the Reich and state, as we said, theoretically, the powers that were given to the 18 states was a counterbalance to central power. Um, in reality, um, there were, I think the key word is contradictions and inconsistencies. Um, th as Lee points out, there were three main types of, of, of involvement here, and they were not managed consistently. So the best type of involvement um, was where um, the powers were used um, to deal with um, uh, the, the, the threats to the, uh, to the separate states. So there was a perceived threat from the far left, for example, the communists in 1923, where the communists threatened to seize power in Saxony and, Thur and Thuringia. Um, and on that occasion, Article 48 was used to put down that perceived threat. Um, <clears throat> but in the same year, when there was a perceived threat from the far right in Bavaria, Article 48 was not used. And of course, that threat was from Hitler's putsch. So there was an inconsistency in one year in 1923. Um, the... Um, the <clears throat> where the threat was from the extreme left, um, the central government stepped in to crush that threat in that particular region of Germany. But when the threat was from the right, the central government refrained. So they were applying Article 48 inconsistently um, and f from their political perspective um, which we'll move on to in a minute because of the, the, the sort of right-wing um, um, bias um, that was built into the system. Okay, so moving on to the next. We're now getting towards the end of the chapter. Um, the third example of that um, is an interesting one. Um, in July 1932... Um, the largest of the states, Prussia, was functioning perfectly well. Um, it had an SPD government, the state of Prussia, and yet in July 1932, Chancellor Papen used Article 48 to override the influence of the SPD and effectively asserted the power of the central government to take over the government of Prussia. So that's an example of where 
the constitution, which was designed to enshrine the sovereignty of the separate states, give them powers to run, make their own decisions on local matters, was just run rough, roughshod, roughshod over um, the, um, the, 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 the powers of Prussia. Why? Because Prussia was controlled by the SPD and because central government was dominated by right-wing forces. So we move on now to the sort of final pressure. Okay, so what are we talking about here? The problem is, is that although the constitution was designed to be ba balanced and unbiased, um, beneath it um, there were considerable pressures from the right wing who were given an undue influence. So the internal balances within the constitution uh, to make sure that the constitution was balanced and worked properly taking into account all views um, were put under pressure from external groups and in particular the right-wing conservative forces who increasingly um, worked with the extreme radical right and when we say the radical right we mean the growing influence of the nazis who were pulling more and more votes, particularly from 1930 onwards. Now, what do we mean by this undue influence of the extreme right? Where did this appear? Well, this appeared in what we call the establishment, um, the fixed machinery of government uh, that um, is there to make government work. That's the job of the establishment is to implement the law. Now, the establishment, very usefully, um, the uh, Stephen Lee breaks it down into the particular components. He breaks it down into three main components. First of all, the judiciary system. The judiciary system was biased in the Weimar Republic. It favoured the right wing. Judges were right wing. So when people um, were brought before the courts because they had broken the law, um, the judges were much harsher in dealing with left-wing criminals. An example of that is there were 3,000 to 4,000 left-wing prosecutions in the Weimar Republic, but um, in the same period there were only 41 right-wing prosecutions. Why was this? Because there was no change of the judges in 1919. This is the, the argument, was really there was there really a revolution in 1919? <clears throat> On one level, there was a revolution because the, 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 the monarchy was removed, the, uh, the, the Second Reich collapsed, and Germany became a republic. <clears throat> but there was a great deal of continuity. Uh, beneath it, people kept their jobs, and influential people kept their jobs. So many of the judges of the Weimar Republic were the same judges from the Second Reich. They kept their jobs after 1919. Also, those judges were politically biased. Many of them were connected to the DNVP. Um, and so when a judge is making a decision in the court, they're supposed to be biased. But they tended to view criminal activity through a political lens. And the best example, of course, is that when Hitler in 1923 was put on trial for, for uh, being a traitor, I mean, he tried to overthrow the government, he launched an attempted coup, it failed. Um, he should have been put away to, to prison for life, but he was given um, effectively less than a year in jail. That is political bias in the judiciary. Secondly, you have the Reichswehr, the army. Um, use the, the word Reichswehr, don't say the army and when you write essays in the exam, that's important. Um, so the Reichswehr, um, well, as you know from the Second Reich, the Reichswehr were very always very influential. After all, all Germany had been created in 1871 by the army which gave the army a great deal of prestige in germany much more so in other countries well that prestige didn't disappear in 1919 and as we know um Hebert deliberately made a pact with gruner the Hebert gruner pact and so the army had that undue influence in the weimar republic and the army was right wing 
So the army sowed distrust of the Republic at every turn. Um, we've talked about the stab in the back myth that was um, created by Ludendorff um, in October 1918, before um, the in, in the final weeks of the Empire, the, the sort of deliberate plot to let's hand power over to the people who believe in parliamentary democracy. Therefore, they will be as associated with unpopular decisions, in particular, the peace treaty. Um, and we can see this throughout the Weimar Republic. So in the crisis year of 1923, Sikht, um, who was the uh, um, a top-level general in the Weimar Republic, um, got heavily involved in domestic politics, um, using the that crisis year when the, when the, both the extreme left and the extreme right um, were very influential and were attempting to take power. Um, Sikhs in the middle, whose job was to preserve law and order, um, used that position to give the army greater influence in politics in the corridors of power. And that continued throughout the Weimar Republic, and in particular when the Great Depression hit Germany, um, after 1931, there was this man called Schleicher, an army general, who was forever in the corridors of power, in particular close to the ageing president, whispering in his ear, influencing him, and backing the presidential dictatorship under Bruning that we've talked about. Um, and that was done for selfish reasons. It, these people were not working in the interests of Weimar democracy, in the interests of the constitution. And the final group was the civil service, the day-to-day -day functionaries um, who are responsible for implementing and making sure that the law is, is, is implemented, the bureaucrats. Again, the people filling those jobs, in particular the top-level jobs, were scarcely unchanged. These people don't come and go with elections. They are people who hold their jobs, whether it's the police force or whether it's professors in universities or head teachers, um, whether it's um, uh, people working in government departments. They tended to be for the same people from the days of the Second Reich. And they carried with them from the Second Reich into the Weimar Republic their right-wing views, because in the Second Reich, um, it tended to be people who were right-wing who had those jobs. That did not change um, with the when Germany became a republic. So those right-wing tendencies helped prevent the successful operation of social welfare reforms. So the Weimar Republic is well known for having the right intentions. It introduced welfare reforms. It guaranteed that trade unions um, had a say, etc., etc. It introduced unemployment benefits and so on and so forth. But the willingness to implement those laws was lacking. Um, so that undermined the Republic. Um, the laws were implemented half-heartedly. So the civil service um, was a, a constant from the Second Reich before 1919 through the Weimar Republic. And many of those same civil servants continued to serve Hitler's regime in 1933. Why would Hitler get rid of them? because he had no reason to, because they were right-wing in their mentality. A very good example of that would be a, a, the ultimate civil servant, a man called Otto Meissner, who was kind of like the head civil servant. Well, he was a, um, a, he was a, a civil servant in the Second Reich. Um, he continued to be um, a civil servant um, in the Weimar Republic, working under both Hebert and then Hindenburg, and he held his job through into the Third Reich. So all of those points. Don't over -egg that point. On the other hand, it could be argued <coughs> that that continuity, that stability of the administration, and there's a, the key words con continuity, um, was a stabilising force. It's very easy for us as historians to select the evidence to show that the Weimar Republic was weak. Well, let's just say Hitler hadn't taken power in 1933. It could easily have gone wrong. It could, it, the outcome could, could have been very different, different. The Nazis may not have taken power. And if the Weimar Republic had survived, then we would be saying the reason it survived is it had that stability. So you've got to be careful on that. So um, a useful conclusion there. Um, Weimar Germany had all the necessary components to make 
democracy worked. Each component by itself looked to be very good, very strong, but it was the way they worked together that was the problem. Um, the balance between the separate components was flawed. Um, and of course, that was not foreseen. I mean, Hugo Preuss thought he'd written a very strong constitution. Um, so you've got uh, separate components that are strong that would not work very well together, which made the constitution structurally weak. But that in itself does not mean it was destined to fail. What really weakened it was the the external pressures that exploited those weaknesses. Um, so there were internal mal malfunctions, but that by itself was not um, the, the reason um, that the Weimar Republic was weak. They were deliberately exploited by the right wing. OK, so there we are. That's um, a, a walk and talk through Stephen Lee's excellent essay. Uh, make sure you read the original essay. Don't just rely on this videocast and those notes. I hope that was useful for you.